This is the uh, second chapter of the book God Dictated to Me, Isaiah 53 and the Day of the Lord, which is on the, uh, if you go to my YouTube channel and read the about, you can find these two books. He also did The Life of God's Righteous Servant, which would be me. And he did it, it's primarily just focused on Matching up with the verses of Isaiah 53. Shun, despise, held of no account, a man of pain and suffering, familiar with disease, crushed with disease but given long life after being exposed to death. It, it focuses in on those things. But this is something that's called the ancestral tree. But a shoot shall grow out of the stump of Jesse. A twig shall sprout from his stock. The Spirit of the Lord shall alight upon him. And we find in Ezekiel that means alight and enters. And God is in his spirit. Isaiah 11 could have just as well read. The Spirit of God alight upon him. It could have just as well said the Spirit of God and God lit upon him and entered him. Two, two beings that are divine and a man. That's a man, divine beings that uh, Jacob mentions uh, that he wrestled with. And during that wrestling match, the man told him, or God told him, speaking through the man, and I know how that works, I now change your name from Jacob to Israel. Uh, all, all your prophets, if you can hear God speak, he has, and his spirit has, a little upon you and entered you. Basically, he manipulates your mind such that you, you, you hear the conversation. Or he can talk to you without using words. Just puts a knowing into your mind. And that's what we call it, knowing. Um, I'll just... That's just a little backdrop. Isaiah prophetically refers to the stump of Jesse, father of King David, as an announcement of the ending of the line of the kings of Judah, whose last king, Jeconia, was banished and the line terminated, including his children, from ever ruling over Judah again. The lines the line of the kings of Judah is, is, is the uh, is the ancestral tree forbidden to ever rule over Judah and Jerusalem. The tree fell, leaving only a stump. It is the line of heirs in the first chapter of the book of Matthew of the New Testament. The line of Jesus. The line of Jesus doesn't come from the stump. He can't be the man of Isaiah 11. He cannot be the anointed one. Moshiach, or as they say, Messiah, cannot be. He, do, he doesn't fit the first verse. He doesn't come from the stump. God did not banish this line of Jesse of the kings of Judah until long after the death of Isaiah. God knew in Isaiah's time that the line of the kings of Judah would be taken into exile and the temple destroyed. That he would end that time, that line, leading just a stump of Jesse for his anointed one to be raised from. Jesus could not fulfill the book of Isaiah. He comes from the tree cut down, not the stump that's left over. The twig sprouts from the shoot. Okay, the twig, anointed one, sprouts from the shoot, the, the descendant, that grows out of the stump of the felled tree, a new ancestral tree. Now, we don't have the ancestral tree from the stump to Moshe yet. We only know that Jesus, for sure, 
because we have the line of the kings of Judah, we know he didn't come from the stump. For he is grown by his favor, like a tree crown, like a tree trunk out of arid ground. That's Isaiah 53, verse 2. This continues the semblance, symbolism of an ancestral tree. This man grown by the favor of God like a tree crown. From a sinful man whose life has been full of pain, suffering, and sorrows, familiar with the disease, that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that's the angel of God's presence, the Holy Spirit. He's an angel, and his body is the Spirit of God. A light's upon, and God, <coughs> uh, to the crown of God's righteous servant, who is, as it turns out, he represents four righteous servants. We have four righteous servants to come, but we only have one description. And the description is me. But the prophet like Moses has never arrived. I've already, uh, God has already dictated two books to me. He dictated the Torah to Moses. That makes me the prophet like Moses. I talk to God, friend to friend, face to face. That makes me a prophet. <clears throat> to the crown of God's righteous servant who is David, Elijah, and a prophet like Moses. It's explicit. It's implicit. You have to have a description. The sages and early rabbis knew that. That's why they were always saying 53 describes the leper scholar, they called him. A man diseased but who, who makes the many righteous with his knowledge, not his death, not his blood. There are other verses of Isaiah 11 that connect the anointed one to the man in Isaiah 53. I'm talking with God and see if he wants me to read these four paragraphs. You don't want me to? Okay. Um, so, the anointed one, and by the way, the anointment is the spirit alighting upon you. It's, it, that's like having drops of oil dripped on your head in a, a, a ritual between humans, you know, anointing somebody to be a knight. Uh, for instance, or something like that. That's the anointment. That's how we, why we call him the anointed one. It doesn't actually say that uh, by the words. It, and it doesn't say what the anointment's for. You know, it says it's for a purpose that it might prosper, but that's it. But we find a lot more when we get to Malachi 3. We find all the answers. It really comes down to four or five books. Uh, Isaiah. Jeremiah, which tells us the day of the Lord is here, today, Jeremiah 31. See a time is coming, see a time is coming, see a time is coming. It's here. By those very words that, <laughs> that follow that verse starting like that. Yeah, it's here. He's going to make a new covenant. See, prophet like Moses is again. I have two covenants to deliver. Sin forgiveness from Jeremiah 31 he says, I'll make a covenant with you to write Torah on your heart. That's just a metaphor. He says, then all will heed me for or because I will forgive your sins and remember them no more. The covenant out of Jeremiah is sin forgiveness. That leaves only one, the covenant of friendship that God grants to Israel when Moshe acts here. Because he makes Moshe act, he dismisses all the other uh, shepherds of the world. They are all dismissed before God. 
and appoints me as the only teacher he recognizes. Now they can get out from under that dismissal, but they're going to have to teach these books and they're going to have to bring Judaism out of antiquity and into the modern age of science and medicine and knowledge and information. We don't believe in resurrection of the dead. Ramban did. It's part of his 13 fundamental principles of Judaism. The problem is, the problem is that was written for antiquity first. You gotta, you gotta look it back over. You can't just come out and say our sages say. Yeah, but they're from a different time. A different people. For the most part, a people of absolute ignorance, which is not true today. Nobody knows if, if, if any schools even existed back in antiquity in the early Middle Ages. Okay, well, there's the ancestral tree. Jesus cannot, cannot be uh, Moshiach, or as they say, Messiah cannot be. Does not come from the stump of Jesse. And I know I did, because the Spirit lit upon me. First verse of Isaiah 11. I mean, that's just, I mean, believe me, you know. When two divine beings enter you and start controlling your mind, your speech, uh, your eyes, your reading, your body, uh, he kept on with Ezekiel. Ezekiel's another good book to read. You got Isaiah, Jeremiah. Uh, Ezekiel's good. It's kind of a key to understanding Isaiah 53, and you got Malachi 3. All you got to do is put those four together, and uh, you're in the day of the Lord. Because that's the only place you're going to find another mention, other than the co uh, friendship covenant, of a covenant. God says, <clears throat> I'm uh, sending my messenger before me to clear the way, for I will return to my temple. And the angel of the covenant that uses desire, sin forgiveness, is already on the way. And that's a really interesting story. Why is the angel, which is the angel of God's presence, leaving early? But God is here. Okay, this is the day of the Lord. We're in Malachi 3. And we have to build a temple for him. Don't build it. The last words of the prophets, Malachi 3. God says, when I come, I will come with utter destruction to the land of Israel. And he doesn't mean he's going to do it in his power. But he, he, he considers himself his creation. Absolute power and absolute knowledge. That's basically his definition of God. Now, if you build it, the covenant of friendship says... God says, I will place my temple amongst you. So he knows it's not there. And he's going to help me get it done. Just like he helped Moses. He went with Moses to Egypt and came back with him. Same thing. He and his spirit will live upon Moses. There's, there's many other references. In there, about, about four that you can say. Even the radiant face. Uh, and his uh, attendant, Hoshi. You can find and, and see what the scripture is saying, you know, that uh, God and the Spirit of God were with him. And that even holds true in some places, a lot smaller with King David. And as I said, all your prophets, if they mention something God says, then they're men and divine beings too. I, I think every single one of the 20 plus prophets were men and divine beings. Okay. Well, thanks for listening. This is a very important material. Uh, you're not going to get this from another man. You're not going to get these kind of proofs from anybody. If, if these books, my proof, God gave Moses three proofs, he gave me three proofs. And it begins with these books. Because I couldn't possibly have the knowledge that's in them. If I did have that knowledge of my own, I would be the smartest, the most intelligent, most knowledgeable 
rabbi or sage that has ever lived in the history of the Jewish people. And I promise you, that could not be. I'm a pretty smart guy. I'm not that smart. And uh, I was an atheist for 50 years. I've never had any training. I don't have any religious friends. You know, right now, I'm sure that's going to change. But so you're not going to get a greater proof than you see right before you right now. As hard as it is to believe. I remember telling God one day out on a walk. I said, I know you're God. And he said, I know you do. I make sure of it sometimes. I said, but it's been two years and I still can't believe you really exist. He said, well, I do. <laughs> friend to friend. We, we have uh, a lot of good times, but uh, his five refinement, which I think you've heard of, uh, is an absolute brutality. It is so harsh and so tough, but it has changed me. He's been showing me a lot the last couple of days how I react so differently to things. Much calmer, much less agitated, irritated, angered. Yeah, I, it's, it's all working, but of course it's been almost 16 years. Day in and day out. And the stories I had. Uh, again, everything is answered that you would ever have to, to want to know about the things God has to say on Judaism. None of which has to do with the Torah. He's quite happy with what the Jewish people have done with the Torah. It's the rest of the book. And, and he didn't just dictate Torah to Moses. That entire book is his. He dictated it, for instance, to Isaiah, Malachi, all of them. And he could have used other people to do it and use those names. But uh, the entirety of the book is his. None is mine. I couldn't anymore come up and understand all this, you know. And I, I see the rabbis just drop the ball. They make mistakes. And, and it snowballs into an avalanche of getting things wrong. And, we're, and God just wants that straightened up. It, it seems like an attack on Judaism, but it's not. It's what God wants. Coming to the modern era. Some of these things were written just for the people of antiquity. Who believed in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't even know, what, for the most part, what a spiritual heaven would be. They didn't even want to be that close to God. He was so angry all the time. Okay, well, I've just been kind of filling up a little space. It's a real short chapter. Uh, I'll be picking up on chapter 3 next. I can't remember. Uh, it has to do with the Holy Spirit, the creation of the angel of God's presence, the Holy Spirit, who is a person. Judaism doesn't think the Holy Spirit of God is a person, which is absolutely ridiculous because in the Bible itself, he talks and he takes Ezekiel <laughs> on a vision to the Shabbat. Without God going with him. He can be grieved. Anyway. I, I, sometimes I just shake my head and I just tell myself, look, this is men teaching men. And I learned from God who wrote the book. So, you know, I know I'm right every time. Just the way it is. <laughs> well, it's because of the hand. I mean, it's not, nothing I could have done on my own. All right.